Thank you so much. And as part of our opening, I'd like to take the time to acknowledge that we are being hosted this morning on Coast Salish Nation's traditional and unceded territories. And those territories are the Kwantlen Nation, Keitsi, Tsuwasan, Semiamu, Stolo, and Saanich Nations. And in standing alongside the Truth and Reconciliation Accord, it behooves each of us to investigate our histories with these lands and our access to the resources connected to these beautiful lands. Thank you so much. We are ready to roll. With no further ado, welcome Trevor Josephson. And I'm going to ask Trevor to please introduce himself, how you arrived at your work in hospice. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about that, Trevor, please. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, uh, welcome everybody. It's great to uh, see you all here today. Uh, we do have a, a presentation, a webinar um, on a very important topic. I believe it's very important and you wouldn't be here today if you didn't think it was very important. Uh, I hope to uh, share some of my experience uh, as my role as a counselor here at the Hospice Society. And uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, learn a little bit and share some of our perspectives and, and uh, on this uh, important topic about uh, end of life journey. Uh, how did I uh, come about uh, to be doing this uh, webinar on this topic? Well, I've been a counselor here for a number of years, as you all know, and uh, it's been a great privilege and honor for me uh, to be doing this work here. I found that uh, um, it's, it's a type of work that when, when people ask, what, what, what do you do? What kind of counseling do you do? And I say, well, end of life bereavement counselor, right away they, they, they get this uh, sense that, oh, that must be a horrible, uh, how do you do that? It must be very challenging, very hard. And yes, it does have its challenges, obviously. But I find that uh, as, uh, it's so rewarding in so many ways uh, to be able to um, uh, be part of, a, of an experience that someone is going through, an end of life or bereavement, uh, because it really does um, showcase the, um, the enduring quality of the human spirit to go through a transformation of epic proportions. I, I, what I've come to realize is that uh, uh, end of life is, well, there's these experiences that one will have across their, 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 their lifespan that are very uh, intimate and very personal. And I didn't realize um, that death, that dying, was one of those very intimate and very personal experiences that one may have. And um, to be able to uh, be a small part of that and to provide support, as many of you here do in your roles as volunteers and, and, and with your family and friends in the community, providing support to those who are going through a very personal experience such as this, uh, whether it be their own personal end of life experience or if it's grieving for a loved one who's died. So uh, I'm really uh, grateful to uh, be able to present uh, a webinar on some of the aspects of this experience uh, for you today. And uh, as uh, Tricia mentioned, if you do have any questions along the way, uh, ask or share any comments. I'm going to uh, start our uh, presentation by sharing my screen with you. And as you uh, will know, this uh, particular uh, webinar series is called Mapping Your End of Life Journey. And this, uh, today, this presentation uh, is called Sharing the Journey, the Emotional and Spiritual Needs End of Life. Okay, so today's outline, starting a new journey toward hospice palliative care. It'll be one portion that we're going to cover and then after we discuss that we'll be talking about the road of uncertainty and change as the illness dominates a person's experience uh, and then uh, talking about some aspects of when and, and ending approaches uh, and then just briefly touch upon at the very end of our presentation today a new journey begins. An important topic of conversation I think it's probably one of the most important topics of conversation. It's gotta be one of the most 
impactful experiences of one's life. And I think we spend a lot of our time avoiding the topic, not talking about it. Um, but the more we can gain a sense of comfort with it, the more we can open up our conversation about death and dying. And I believe that that is the best way to improve the quality of that experience. I think if we deny it or, or not talk about it, then it's going to create complications perhaps or make it more difficult. I think it's really important that we do talk about it. But we live in a society that, well, it wants to deny death, doesn't it? Doesn't, not only do we want, not want to talk about it, but we don't want to believe that it's actually going to happen. Uh, here we have this concept that can we achieve immortality? You know, we see this in science fiction, we see this in fantasy, but as we can also see in science journals, it actually gets discussed as almost a serious topic. So that really does suggest that we are looking for uh, some way to maybe sidestep the uh, inevitability of end of life. Can you program your DNA for immortality? Or maybe we could just cheat death by drinking lots of pomegranate juice. You know, there's all kinds of um, uh, claims out there uh, of different uh, uh, things that we can do. And maybe not cheating death so much as just uh, obviously there's uh, ways to improve our health and and uh, uh, increase uh, perhaps a longer life, but uh, can we really cheat death in any way? More and more people are living to be 100 years plus even. So there is such a thing as increasing longevity, but uh, the secrets of living longer, what, what uh, might be behind that? And what is our motivation for that? Um, and is it possible that we can, uh, Continue to live for, for very long years. Of course, the question does arise, well, what quality of, of life would we have if we were to reach 142 years old? Here's a nice quote from old Groucho Marx. I intend to live forever or die trying. I think humor ha ha helps us in this uh, conversation. Okay, now let's start um, looking at it when a new journey towards hospice and palliative care begins. Um, the focus is going to change when someone uh, receives the diagnosis. Um, it's a huge impact. Their life changes overnight. And then as the disease advances and they reach a point where the cure is no longer possible, uh, they move from aggressive treatment, palliative care. And this could be a change that happens suddenly, or it could be a change that happens very gradually. And that's going to have an effect on the person's ex experience. I don't think it's, you know, I don't think we're all oriented towards dying. I, I think we all kind of have a, a strong will to live. And I think that that is something that we become very aware of when we are struggling with a terminal illness. Uh, I've seen that happen in many people and it's normal and it's natural. It's not, uh, it's not uh, necessarily labeled as denial, uh, but we do what we are programmed to do. We're programmed to thrive and to live. So we can understand that it's natural that there would be some struggle uh, as we um, enter uh, an advanced illness uh, and are informed by uh, medical care that there is no cure. Um, so we also see that the healthcare system is not comfortable with, with failure, really. Uh, th their, their objective is to, to heal and to make someone better. And... Um, they will struggle when, when they are not able to achieve that. And so not, not all aspects of healthcare, not all practitioners of healthcare, but uh, some of them may actually see it as a, as a failure on their part or on the system, the medical uh, world's uh, part. 
And that might create some confusion for the person who is dying or for their family. Uh, and it may even result in some very insensitive communication from the healthcare. That is something that happens very often. And it's unfortunate. But uh, we, we also see that our hopes uh, change. Uh, we, we start shifting between hope and denial. Uh, so we uh, focus on optimistic, perhaps idealistic thinking. That's very normal to, to want to stay positive. Um, and we start saying, you know, we deserve better considering everything that we've done here. We've been doing all the tests. We've been doing everything that the oncologists have told us to do. Uh, why is this not proving force? Why are we being told now that there is no more that can be done? We've tried so hard. We deserve better. Um, but this can all result in, in min minimal Minimizing the information that's available, I think, for the person, family. Um, and it could create a misunderstanding and maybe even er an erosion of support. You know, it, it's normal to review the journey up to that point for someone. Um, they, they receive the, the information from the medical uh, practitioners that there's no longer any uh, options for treatments. There is no cure. And um, they might even be given a prognosis, a, a, a length of time. Uh, and they're told to, uh, it's now time to get your affairs in order, as they call it. Uh, but it's normal to, to, to question, well, have we, is there something else that we can try? Have we exhausted all options? Second opinions, third opinions, alternative approaches, all these things are, are very valid um, to, uh, perspectives to, to uh, at that time. So here we have uh, part of the challenge of, um, of an end-of-life experience that a person may go through or their family may struggle with, the focus changing. So what can be a, a response for that? We uh, now find ourselves on a new path. So if we're on a new path, if that's what's happened, we have to shift our perspective to now accommodate that new path. Not and this shift involves a, a perspective of not managing this disease, but managing uh, the rest of one's life. Okay, so we're talking about um, really important decisions that can start to be made. A shift in perspective. These decisions can only be made though if there is that shift in perspective. Um, we're talking about quality of life focus. It's not about quantity of time. It's now shifting towards the quality of that time. Um, by this point, uh, the person who is struggling with a, a terminal illness and their family have probably become expert in uh, maintaining hope. So uh, again, we, we, we're going to keep coming back to this idea of denial versus hope and how one might kind of shift back and forth between the two. Um, so using one's energy to build meaningful opportunities that are still possible is going to be a big part of uh, what, what a person is going to be deciding to do as they find themselves on a new path, except that they're on a new path and change their perspective of that. Um, probably focusing on enjoyable, valuable experiences, however one may um, define that for themselves personally, uh, is going to be an important um, of what they're going to to uh, to do at this point. Now they might still have one foot in the uh, options of uh, treatments. They might still have one foot there. They might still have a couple uh, options that they want to keep available. Just in, in the in the case that there might be some ways to uh, alleviate some of the the, the medical uh, suffering that they're going through, or to maybe even end how much time they have or improve the quality of that time. Uh, but again, denial being um, uh, one of the realities of this is normal. It's a way of coping. It lets us kind of cushion things so we don't get, you know, pummeled with, with uh, the full reality all at once. It gives us time to adjust. Very important to give us ourselves that time. Uh, families need to review all the information probably over and over again. Many times they'll ask the same questions over and over again. They'll keep going back. They might, again, get a second or even a third opinion. Uh, and um, 
And this could be due to stress, it could be due to anxiety, preventing them from, from you know, really assimilating all the information. It's a lot to take in all at once when you're told that uh, you have now reached uh, end of life, now inevitable, and uh, time is limited. Um, so very important for people to identify supports and reach out early. The earlier the better. Doesn't mean that they have to engage in those supports actively right away, but just reach out and uh, find out what's there and create some relationships. Uh, here's a diagram of uh, what we can see happening at the bottom of the, the picture here, loss of ability being both physical, mental, uh, contracts a person's experience, range of ability, range of experience gets contracted. They are no longer able to uh, have parties. Maybe they enjoyed having parties. They can't do that anymore. They don't have the energy for it. Uh, they're no longer able to uh, attend any um, university courses or uh, go to seminars or, or um, workshops. So their educational goals are, are, are very much curtailed. Uh, they uh, used to maybe sail. They can't go sailing anymore or rock climbing or some of these physical activities, kayaking. They can't do those things anymore. And they can't work anymore. Uh, it, it, they might have perhaps been still uh, engaged in, in some type of work, but they find that they can't do that anymore. So as their experience contracts, they it's a normal thing to just um, feel like giving up or feel kind of focus on the negative or what can't be possible. Uh, but what a person can do at this point as they shift their perspectives is start looking at, okay, well, I can't do my parties anymore. I can't hold dinner parties like I used to, but I could still have group video chats. I heard about this new thing called Zoom that everybody's using. Maybe I can get my uh, grandson or granddaughter to come over here and show me how to use it. And maybe we can set something up that way. I can't go to uh, take any of these workshops that I want to go to to enhance my educational goals, but I can still do my own personal reading. There's this pile of books that I've always wanted to read. Uh, there's personal study and research I can do uh, from, from home. Um, creating photo books of your enjoyable past activities of sailing or rock climbing, whatever they might have been. Uh, create, gathering all of those photos that one took over the the many, many years and uh, telling a story through that. And uh, one can't work anymore. Well, hey, maybe now's the time to dictate those uh, memoirs that you always wanted to write um, and ask for, assist for some assistance with that. There's all kinds of software now that's available to allow people to dictate uh, into a, a word, straight into a Word document and then someone can uh, for a person so they can I guess what we're talking about here is uh, something that people experiencing end of life find is very very helpful for them uh, in, in, in accepting what is happening and preparing we call it legacy work it's uh, preparing uh, to, to um, define what their legacy is which really helps them to understand the meaning of their life which continues on So starting a new journey towards uh, hospice and palliative care, what is the dying person's perspective? The, the most critical part of the whole thing, after all, this is their experience. They have their family and their caregivers, their loved ones, their friends uh, that are, are, are with them on the journey to a certain point, but really it is only a journey that they can go on. As I said, it's a very personal, intimate. Uh, the experience of advancing illness, um, is uh, going to be forefront for them. Uh, the nature of the illness, what it is, uh, how the decline is happening for them. And this could be expressed in words, it could be expressed in emotions. It could be what we, I mean, so we're looking at something that's multi dimensional. Okay. It affects us in all ways. It affects us. I guess the emotional aspects of it, the physical aspects of it is, are there uh, so profoundly because we are facing our limits. We have come up to the limits of some of our physical ability, of some of our emotional ability. We're pushed sort of to the extremes in this. So, um, and those limits can become doors or they can become 
doors that stop us from moving forward or it can be doors of opportunity to open. And that again is a very personal uh, thing. But many people will find that they slip into this place of protecting their family. Uh, they, 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 they want to, um, they want to save their family, protect them from some of these emotional experiences, the, the mental experience and the physical experiences that the family members will also be having. And this can become difficult for families. This could create blocks in connection and uh, erode some of the potential supports that, that the family are able to get. Um, we'll talk about some of the ways that um, we can uh, approach getting affairs in order is going to be uh, part of what a person may want to do or they might want to avoid doing it and there's going to be some personal choices around this um, or they may defer this to someone else in, in the family say you know um, can you do this can you take care of these things re-experiencing favorite or meaningful things Okay, so this is, uh, again, we're, we're looking at um, not seeing and not limiting yourself at, at a time when you can be refocusing your energy into areas that are meaningful for you. And again, think of that, how it, it contracts, but it can also expand in other ways. Just because we can't do a physical activity anymore doesn't mean that we can't re-experience the meaning of it. And it might be a scaled down version. It might be, uh, I can't climb that, uh, the Stuamish Chief, but I can go and sit at the bottom of it and look up there and, and take in the flavor of it visually. So some of the responses, identify and explore your feelings. This is something that we're gonna come to in a, in a, in a more um, direct way in another slide, but it's gonna be very, very important uh, to, um, get in touch with one's personal thoughts and feelings um, and to express them. But it's difficult, right? It's difficult sometimes with family and friends. Sometimes the people who are closest to us are the ones that um, it, it can be the most difficult conversations to, to, to have with the ones that are closest to us. And that's where counseling support helpful, um, group, anything that might be available along that. Uh, family and friends shouldn't take it personally if they find that their um, friend or family member is experiencing the end of life is not able to really open up and share openly. Uh, but it's important to normalize the grief process. And part of that normalizing is to acknowledge the reality of this thing that we call anticipatory grief. Now the person who is uh, facing end of life will have an anticipatory grief as they start to let go of many aspects of their life. And the people who are companioning them are also going to be experiencing anticipatory grief. When, when we see anticipatory grief happening, we could see many of the hallmarks of what grief and bereavement experiences are uh, occurring. So uh, some of the things that we see like anger, denial, um, fear, sadness, depression, those sorts of symptoms of grief can be experienced before the death happens. But it gives opportunities for life review, like we mentioned, making meaning. This is something that uh, existentialists say that we do throughout our whole life. This is part of what uh, a human being does, uh, just naturally, uh, is make meaning. The more we engage in that, the more uh, structured it is, uh, the, the more um, benefits that we'll get out of that. And it's never too late to um, explore meaning making in our life. I think a lot of people through most of their life, they, they, they're doing it without really knowing that they're doing it. They don't call it that. But going out and experiencing uh, memorable uh, times with family and friends, achieving goals, aspirations, these sorts of things uh, contribute towards uh, and uh, meaning making in our life um, and then we find afterwards that wow I was doing that and now I'm going to engage in it in an even more thoughtful way as I review aspects of that in my life and continue to make meaning right up to the moment of death. 
identify what is unfinished. There might, I mean, not everybody will have this, but some people might have a sense of, you know, there's some things that have been uh, uh, incomplete and I'm not going to feel comfortable until I have some sense of, um, of completion on those. Or maybe even just, you know, approach that to some degree. Maybe there's not a complete, um, you know, a completed scenario that will, will escape as possible, but uh, to explore that and to come to terms with the uh, incompleteness that might exist is um, certainly going to be a uh, part of one's end of life experience if, if they want that, if they're open to that. This could also, this could, at this point, could involve uh, family um, estrangements um, that uh, we'll touch upon. I said that we were going to talk about emotions a little bit more. Um, we, we can't do anything in life without emotions being pulled into it as being a very important part of life experience. Uh, when I look at emotions, I, I like to see them as, as kind of like our five senses. We have touch, taste, uh, visual senses, uh, smell, uh, hearing. These five senses help us to navigate our physical world. They help us to take in information that's happening around us brain makes some you know, computations and then makes some decisions on what to do next. I think emotions kind of act the same way, don't they? I mean, we have emotional experiences. Uh, something happens in our environment. We have an emotional response to it. Our brain processes that and then responds to whatever that is in our environment uh, accordingly. Uh, so I think if, if, that's, if that is what emotions do for us, then they're extremely important especially at impactful times of life. We want to listen to our emotions, see them as guideposts on a, on a map. So uh, the emotional experience is going, going to be very important as a person experiences changes in their, their physical body, which will happen uh, when there's a terminal illness. Uh, we're talking about um, things that you probably can't control happening body and we are animals of control we we like to have control of our physical environments that's kind of programmed into us as a, a survival mechanism so if we don't have control of what's going on in our physical body we're going to have a, an emotional response to that there might be a sense of betrayal my body's betraying me what is going on uh, all these medical treatments and all of these alternative uh, approaches i've been taking alternative healing uh, uh, systems I'm engaging in and the healthcare system itself it could be some anger towards it or um, a sense of um, you know it's really let me down and I feel very despondent about that. promises made that are not being fulfilled uh, so now we come back to the balance between hope and denial okay, so uh, we can be maintaining hope of, of uh, an outcome in a certain area of our end of life experience. Maybe it's a uh, reduced symptomology. Maybe it's uh, an emotional hope that we have of what our experience is going to be. But then there's also gonna be that denial that might keep coming in there. Uh, you know, that, that would be again, a normal part of the uh, human experience. A person might be having questions about their future. What is it going to be like for me as my illness advances? And what is it going to be like for my family? There could be a lot of fear. There could be a lot of trepidation around that. Emotions might be suppressed. They might be unpredictable. They might be intense. The effort to maintain a positive and hopeful attitude might be a big part of what person is putting their energy towards. Um, Earlier in the experience, of just after their diagnosis and when they first were going through treatments, that might have served them very well at that point. But now, it might be kind of getting in the way as their perspective needs to shift as they're on a different path. So some of the response that we're going to be talking about is normalizing the feelings. Okay, Don't stifle them. Don't minimize them. Don't downplay them. Normalize them and listen to them. Uh, might we even say create a relationship with those what are, they, what are they saying what do they have to tell us even the ones that are uncomfortable 
you know, the ones that we're not so comfortable having. We create space for them and listen to those feelings and emotions. They might have something really important to tell us that will motivate us to do something and to maybe help us to shift our perspective. So we want to create a space for that. We want to have a space for this emotional expression. And that's going to have a lot to do with the people that are with us. So uh, our family, our friends, those who are companioning us, they might be some um, healthcare people. They might be uh, hospice volunteers. Um, we want to create a space that we can feel safe and comfortable and expressing right from the heart what's happening in the world. And again, we said earlier that there might be some hesitation to express some of this with family and friends. There might be a fear of uh, what this uh, might bring up to the surface. Um, and maybe it's not possible. Uh, I would certainly um, uh, suggest exploring that with family and friends for the person who is dying. Uh, but uh, if they find that that's not possible, um, there are other options out there. Again, we have hospice societies that are available to provide counseling uh, support for people, we have individual and group support for people who are struggling with end of life and for their family members. I caught myself saying struggling with uh, end of life, and I just want to interject there for a moment to say uh, end of life experience, you don't have to be struggling with it to gain benefit from um, hospice society services. That's, that's, yes, we're there for that. We're there for those who are, are struggling with aspects of that, and it's normal to struggle with, with it along the way. Uh, but I, I find that, uh, as we said earlier, um, end of life is a universal experience that everyone's going to have, but it's a very impactful, meaningful experience that uh, is probably, you know, one of those um, life experiences that helps us define who we are. So when we go through other experiences like that in life, uh, it might be um, a, the birth of a child, uh, um, uh, Embarking on a new career, uh, a new relationship, might be um, transitioning from adolescence to adulthood. It might be, you know, these, these huge um, transitions in, in life uh, that obviously we can gain support and um, benefit by reaching out and uh, seeking spiritual or psychological counseling. And um, why not so uh, at end of life as well? So creating a space to accommodate that is an important thing. Uh, and being comfortable with those feelings right across the board. No feelings are wrong to have. Even if they feel uncomfortable, even if they don't make us feel all that good, they're not bad to have. Communication is so important. It, uh, it's... Um, mandatory really uh, it's going to open up those doors uh, as human beings we use uh, our verbal abilities to communicate our thoughts to communicate our feelings to bring these abstract concepts out into the open and try to figure out well what does it really mean to me what is this all about but it might be hard to find the words to use it's difficult to talk about what's happening uh, at a time like this uh, talking directly about the realities of, of end of life might might seem insensitive for some people. Uh, they might be afraid of, of what, uh, what those words might sound like as they come out of their mouth or to see them now dangling in the air in front of them and the impact that they might have. Uh, words don't, also, words don't capture the enormity of what people are really thinking and feeling. Words are limited. They're, 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 they're just letters put together in combinations to form vowels and consonants. They're limiting. That's all they are. Um, but we can use other forms of communication. We can express emotions in other ways. We can express our thoughts in other ways. Uh, there's always music. There's always art. There's always, always poetry, dance. Uh, there's ritual. There's so many different ways that the hum humans uh, throughout time have found to express the things that cannot be expressed in words. But not to be afraid to try right? Not to be afraid to put those words out, out into the open, and then to, uh, sometimes we hesitate, sometimes we hold back, and if everyone's holding back, 
are really down and deep down inside. They all want to talk about it, but everyone's holding back. That's going to do everyone a disservice. Why not venture out there? Share some of those words. Share some of those thoughts and feelings. See where they might go. Because you might find that a friend or family member are very open to that. They were just kind of waiting for an opportunity. It might just take someone that, you know, that we're talking about uncomfortable conversations. They're easy to avoid. No one wants to have them. If there's something that we don't want to do, it's easy to uh, procrastinate or to avoid having them. Uh, families are trying to prepare themselves and plan for the future, uh, but they're not comfortable talking to the person who's uh, facing the uh, end of eternal illness. Um, they're not comfortable talking about what lies ahead, perhaps. Um, the person themselves who has the terminal illness may not be comfortable talking about it either. But um, we find that protecting one another is a normal thing that might happen. Uh, we feel a need to keep conversation simple, concrete, or positive. But let's be flexible. Let's, let's be a, a little bit uh, flexible in that and see if we uh, might find some way to uh, bring up some of these uncomfortable conversations. Uh, again, it might help to, to um, practice them, to rehearse them ahead of time with uh, others um, or to seek some uh, professional support. Um, response to this, uh, normalize and accept that the, there's gonna be differences in styles and perspectives. Sometimes that has a lot to do with why we hesitate out there. And talk about some of these things as we have a different style or we sense that someone else has a different perspective on it but if we accept that it's normal to have those different, different uh, perspectives then we can normalize it and we can engage in those conversations when under stress people often uh, become more um, probably more entrenched in their perspectives uh, that's a normal thing to, to have uh, you know my way is the right way kind of thing uh, we start to see some of that happen when people start um, experiencing fear something is inevitable is going to happen that they don't want to have happen they latch on to control and they can dig themselves in sometimes but trying new approaches is going to be helpful at this time okay well this is normally how I would approach uh, um, um, a situation that causes me distress Maybe now I need to try a different approach. Uh, maybe I need to imagine uh, another person's perspective about this. Doesn't mean that you have to agree with it, you, but you can kind of put yourself in their shoes or, or try to see it from their perspective and accept that they have a right to have that perspective. Uh, again, um, practicing um, having these conversations might be helpful. Um, so this is a opportunity now where I'm going to um, share a story um, about a client that I worked with, because uh, some of what we're talking about in terms of communication uh, is really relevant in, in the situation. Uh, her name is Cindy, and she contacted the Hospice Society um, upon being diagnosed uh, with a terminal illness, cancer. Um, she was a, a retired counselor herself, so she saw the value and benefit of uh, engaging early on in the, the, uh, in the process uh, in a counseling relationship. Uh, so she started coming for regular visits, based out, um, but then over the as her illness advanced, her visits became more frequent. Uh, she had exhausted all the therapy options uh, for her cancer and was adjusting to all of the changes. And her husband would drop her off at our supportive care center for her regular visits. Um, during our many conversations, she, she told me how she had experienced the, the death of her first husband, who had died by suicide a few years earlier, and how she had, um, after that, reunited with her first childhood uh, sweetheart, her first love. Uh, it was an amazing story. Um, uh, this was this man's name was Gary, and um, they had not seen each other for years and years. And Gary had reached out to her when he found out uh, about her loss, and this initiated a, a contact that eventually uh, developed uh, into a, a romantic relationship. Um, Gary's wife had also um, died, um, and interestingly, of the same type of cancer. 
eventually Cindy and Gary got married. Um, they actually um, had a few really good years together, uh, but the cancer advanced and um, they started to go on that journey of tests and treatments. Cindy started writing poetry. She started engaging in um, exploring some of those inner thoughts, those deep down thoughts and feelings that are hard to access again with words. She used poetry to try to express what it was like for her to approach end of life. And she also used the poetry to um, revisit the loss of her first husband and a very difficult conversation. Writing her poetry helped her to uh, prepare for a very difficult conversation with her daughter. Um, she just had the one child from her first marriage uh, regarding her husband's suicide. Um, and this was very important for her to do. So here we see where um, using a different approach created an opportunity for someone at end of life to um, express some of these things that had to be expressed, to reconcile some really important things. She was able to also express her love and gratitude to her husband, Gary, and, and, um, and her anger, really, for, for having to find, reconnect with her first love and then to have it end too soon. Uh, did she find total acceptance and um, total reconciliation with that? I don't know. I don't know. Um, my last visits with her were in a hospice. And um, she, she struggled a lot and found a lot of um, hope and uh, reconciliation in some areas. Uh, but again, it was a personal journey for her. And um, I, I think that her openness to exploring new ways of, of getting in touch with her feelings was really helpful for her. Other aspects of starting a new journey toward hospice and palliative care, the family issues. Okay, so there's gonna be differences in the family. Undoubtedly, this happens. Uh, every, everyone, I mean, we can't expect all family members to, to do things in the same way, to have the same perspectives on things, to feel things in the same way. Uh, they'll grieve different losses in different ways and at different times. Uh, they can create conflict and confusion as they as they kind of collide with one another. Uh, this is a normal thing to have happen. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the family. Uh, it's it's um, it, almost inevitable that it will happen to one degree or another. And if there was, you know, issues that um, were sort of um, unresolved from the past, a lot of water goes under the bridge in families. Uh, those things can come up at a time like this because tensions are high, emotional uh, tensions are, are revving up really high, and uh, the um, very fragile, vulnerable place, especially as they start to experience the change in roles and responsibilities. This is a hard thing to do uh, when the person who is um, experiencing end of life no longer able to do certain things, they start to step back from the role that they had in the family. And this will create a shift in the family. Okay, well now who's gonna do this? Now who's the one that does that? Uh, also, members of the family will have to start taking on other responsibilities that are now new responsibilities because someone in the family is uh, uh, struggling with uh, terminal illness. And um, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. Um, Acknowledging the conflict, you know, be open to it. Don't don't uh, run away from it. Don't uh, deny that it's happening. Just say, hey, you know what? We're having a conflict here. This this is something that's uh, we're struggling with. Um, so approach it and and take some steps towards addressing it. Um, there's going to be family patterns and routines are going to be altered. Uh, people are going to be struggling to have confidence in themselves at this time. A lot of questions are going to up. Uh, a lot of fears are going to come up to the surface. And this can really lead to a, a sense of loss of identity. Um, the person who is now 
withdrawing from their role in the family because of their illness. They might uh, start feeling a loss of identity. Uh, who am I now? Am I, am I the mother or the father? Am I the grandparent? Um, I can't do those things that I did as the grandparent or as the parent. I can't do those things that I did as, as the, um, the, the financial advisor of the family whatever their role might have been. They might start to feel unneeded, unwant, um, not so much unwanted, but unneeded. And uh, that can be a real blow to, to people who have defined themselves by their role. So uh, acknowledging with that openly with, uh, with everybody and exploring ways that that might be resolved. Um, conflict can be distracting from what is really important. Okay? So we don't want people to spend energy on conflict if not necessary. Um, accepting that not all disrupted relationships are going to be mended. It might not be possible. Um, letting go of the past might mean also letting go of relationships. And this can be a very difficult um, exercise to do. Uh, if resolution is not possible, um, there can be a lot of Different levels of acceptance, I guess, that can happen at this time. Change in mobility. Uh, a person is now perhaps bed bound. Uh, they, they're not able to, to, to get up and uh, uh, go out, um, and visit people or, or go to family gatherings. Now the family is coming to them. And we're now on the road of uncertainty and change as the illness predominant situation. Um, Overall disease progression is pronounced and ongoing and the new symptoms start to happen. And as new symptoms happen, new realities are attached to those changes in, in a person's state. A weakness and fatigue starts to increase and their ability, probably maybe even the comprehension, might start to uh, grow. Um, changes in caregiving routines will now have to take place changes, obviously. Uh, this might increase the reliance on others. So the person who has the illness that is now progressing to this point, they find that they're, they're having to let go of a lot of their independence. And this can be a really difficult thing for some people. Uh, they might start to um, need others just to help them with their most basic needs. Um, now alternatives for care are being considered. Okay, so uh, maybe there's increasing home care that's required. Maybe the family are now reaching a point where they can't do it all themselves. They have to reach out for outside assistance. Um, they might talk about the transition to a hospice at this point that um, quite often families try to do it at home. Um, but they want, that's what their loved one wants. But they reach a point where they're exhausting themselves and the level of care is being compromised. Uh, and then they find when they do transition to a hospice or a care facility, they find that uh, now the quality of time that they spend with their loved time is not distracted with all the caregiving needs and the worries about that. Kind of let someone else take care of that so they could just spend time, really meaningful time with their loved one. So, you know, this brings about a time of contemplation. Uh, for the, the person who has terminal illness, they're going to have a lot of time, if they're bed bound, um, to think about things, to explore things internally. Um, there can be a lot of things that come up to the surface for them as this happens. Um, but they are going to be responding to the changes in their body that are now resulting in changes in their environment. So they're going to have to explore resources. As we said, enhancing the um, amount of care, level of care, um, reaching out to a hospice society to see what respite care is available, um, looking at all the different community resources that, that are available for them. And in some cases, they're going to have to be self-advocates, going to have to be um, actively looking for these resources and exploring what's available. Um, there's going to be some helpful um, yeah, information resources that, that say, you know what, you have access to this, you have access to that. But I would always recommend that families explore that on their own as well, because there might be some things that are not being brought to their attention 
that, that are available for you. See this happen a lot. And no one wants to um, not get access to support and services at this time if it's um, available. Now it's the time to ask and ask large, right? Ask, ask big. They can always say no. You can always have to, you know, um, compromise and get a bit, but it doesn't hurt to ask big. And prior to prioritizing the important decisions. Um, now uh, a person is, is struggling with, okay, um, what can I do with my limited mobility? What am I going to do with my limited energy? I have to really focus on the things that are most important. And that might be uh, people that they're going to be uh, visiting with, uh, the activities that they might engage with. Um, it's going to be an important part of that, that time. Dependence and withdrawal. This is a very difficult time for the person who, who is experiencing their end of life and for the family and friends that are companioning them. Uh, it's normal to periodically retreat within oneself at this time, to withdraw uh, from others, from social activity from the family. Um, and this can be really disquieting for, for family to see happen. Uh, they might misinterpret this. Uh, as we said earlier, dying is a very personal and intimate experience that one goes through. And it is ultimately an experience that they cannot share with, with others. It is an experience, it's a, it's a journey that only they can, can go on um, the final steps. Uh, uh, and some of the family struggle with that, <clears throat> that reality. But they start to acknowledge, uh, they start to accept. Um, the realities are now more, more, um, more obvious, and the significance of their loved ones decline, and the feel that, and they start to feel that the person they knew is starting to disappear. Okay, so this is where the anticipatory grief starts to really be powerful. The social world starts to shrink uh, for both the dying person and and their companions. Um, this is really hard for someone who's, who's been, who, who's defined themselves by uh, their ability to connect with others and, and have relationships with them. Now that part of their identity is being compromised and um, big, big change and shift is starting to happen for them. How to respond to this? Um, identifying goals and priorities. Be really clear with, with, with what's important. Um, Exploring thoughts and feelings about the increased dependency that you're having. Um, being honest with that, uh, how that makes you feel. Reflecting on um, one's personality. Um, there's a cliche that, that gets um, mentioned every once in a while, and I kind of hesitate to mention it, but it does ring true to some degree that we die the way we lived. So I guess what that's saying is that our personality is consistent uh, throughout our life. And uh, why would it change now when we're dying? Were we the type of person that, you know, just jumped in uh, uh, things and, and wanted to have control? Uh, uh, would we, are we the type of person that um, would, would approach things very gently, very softly? Uh, are we the type of person that um, would want to gather around everybody and have a big social party? Or are we the type of person who wants to do this all by ourselves and we start to say no to, to visits? So, um, it really does uh, help maybe if we think about, well, what kind of a person is my loved one who's, who's now approaching end of life? Does, I mean, maybe it makes sense that they are now starting to say that they don't want to have any visitor. But assessing areas of independence and control can be very, very helpful. Um, and these are personal choices that one is going to make. Um, not to focus on what can't be controlled probably is going to be a, an important part of it. Um, shifting the energy to what we do have control over. That's where we can really make those, uh, build the meaning and uh, really gain benefit. Focusing on aspects of living, not dying. This is a foundational philosophy of hospice. We don't talk about people dying so much. We, 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 we focus on the fact that we are all living up to the moment of death. After all, death is but one moment. Um, 
if we focus on the fact that we are all living to the moment of death, there's dignity in that, there is compassion in that, there is meaning in that. Um, a person's fundamental needs, if we don't do this, a person's fundamental needs might be overlooked. Uh, we might be focusing on just the medical aspect. Um, person's emotional, spiritual wishes uh, are really important to be heard at this time. Again, we go back to communication. Open up the dialogue. Ask the person what is important for them, what's meaningful for them at this time. Let's talk about um, Charles, another uh, individual that I had the privilege and honor to spend some time with. Um, during um, his life experience he went through a few years ago. Uh, I met him. Um, he, Charles was, a, was one of these great achievers. He was a very successful man in business. Uh, he had a very um, lucrative and successful um, business uh, uh, in his life. And he was used to having control. He was used to um, controlling all aspects of his business, all aspects of his life and meeting his goals. He was very goal-driven, and um, you know, he, he did, he was very successful in achieving goals in life and achieving positive outcomes. But then he reached uh, the point where uh, he was told that he had a terminal illness. He only had a few months. You can imagine someone who has been very goal-driven and, and, and positive results-oriented in his life, if he's, if he's gonna, um, Face, uh, end of life the way he's lived his life uh, we can imagine he would struggle with it. and he did quite honest he did struggle with that he, he, he went through the the, the um, struggle of denial of anger um, his world began to shrink and eventually he couldn't leave his home uh, eventually he couldn't leave his bed and during this process he had to make adjustments and I was um, impressed uh, in witnessing how he adjusted his goals accordingly. He downscaled his goals. He became realistic. He accepted what was happening for him. Um, he channeled his energy into really important areas that were meaningful for him. He gathered his family around him. He um, started um, giving advice, business advice, to his family members and friends that were running their own businesses. Great pride in being able to share this. He um, engaged in writing his memoirs about his successful career in business. He actually, um, one of our hospice volunteers, assisted him in this endeavor. And it brought him great satisfaction. It, it really kind of brought the meaning of his life into a... Uh, uh, um, concrete form, I would say. Um, and then he also um, got a subscription to one of these online programs uh, that were designed by scientists that featured games that were meant to improve, um, <coughs> improve memory, cognitive abilities, and problem-solving skills. So this was still, he, he, he felt parts of his um, mental acuity were starting to erode, and he wasn't just going to um, let that happen without taking some measures to mitigate it. And uh, it was really interesting how he, um, he found great joy in uh, moving through the levels of this program. And uh, every time I would go to visit him at his home, he would tell me uh, which level he had achieved and, and what part of his memoirs, he would share parts of his memoirs with me. It was a really important uh, part of his experience. And I think um, that it probably uh, helped to bring meaning uh, to his end of life experience in a very powerful way. This is a picture that I found. Um, it's father who was terminally ill, only had a few days left of life, but he had made this commitment or a promise to be at his daughter's wedding. And I, I think it's just so, so meaningful. Um, such a beautiful uh, picture that expresses a, a, a connection, a family connection. But also, why not? I mean, he's able to, he was able to get, um, get into that uh, journey and, and they brought him to the ceremony and he participated in it. And I can imagine um, the meaning that that probably brought to him and his family. And that's a memory that his family will always have. That's part of his legacy now. 
family stress and family grief. There is a change in the responsibilities, caregiving, as the symptoms increase, as the needs increase for the person. Um, they have to change their routines, what they do. Some people have to step back from their daily lives. They have to take time away from work, time away from their families to be with their loved one. Um, there's an increased awareness at this time of the reality of, of, of the approaching um, end of one's life. And um, so we're talking about when people, I mean, this is a gradual process, the reality. Um, and even in grief, it's still one of the, um, one of the challenges of grief, one of the tasks of, of grieving is accepting the young. Uh, people, you know, maybe it's not so easy to do. Maybe it's not a thing that our brain does very simply. Our heart does not just do it overnight. Uh, so you can imagine um, for family and friends and for the person themselves who is experiencing the end of their life, uh, the, uh, the reality of that is something that is a, is a, is a process, an ongoing thing. Um, but being realistic about our limitations, about what, um, where we're at. We don't want to minimize or ignore um, any of the um, challenges of a situation when it's happening. Um, let's be honest about that. Let's talk about that. Because if we do, then we can um, uh, probably find uh, solutions in a much easier way than we would if we didn't being proactive, okay, what uh, stones are still left unturned here? Uh, what can we do to um, approach all of this and uh, be as, as a favorable of a, an outcome as we can for ourselves? It's going to be a meaningful, um, how can we identify potential problems early before they become bigger? So again, reaching out for the resources that are there, um, asking for advice, asking for professional help, is, is going to now more than ever it's going to be the time to do that um, family dynamics uh, are a big part of the situation at this time unresolved issues from the past are like i said earlier may uh, uh, rise up um, so now is a time when people have to emphasize self-care um, we put in here it's 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 not an option um, it's so important to do at this time and some people might feel guilty. Um, you know, they might uh, struggle with taking time to take care of themselves. But the more they can take care of themselves, the better they're going to be taking care of their loved one. Your strengths. It's normal to feel inadequate. Okay? You're being pushed now. Uh, everybody involved is being pushed to the limits and then even beyond. So it's normal to feel like, uh, I, I'm just uh, uh, not doing what I should be doing or I'm struggling with this, I can't do it, I feel I have doubts, I feel like I have no good at doing this. No one's going to be good at doing something that they've never had. To do before. And uh, in a situation with, with a person in the family who goes through end-of-life experience, it's going to be a unique and new experience depending on that. When an end approaches, uh, we're looking at transition from doing to being. So medications have now ceased. Uh, the person is um, experiencing restfulness, a time of peace, or the family might notice some restlessness. Uh, again, uh, medical staff can be consulted on that. There's different approaches that can be taken uh, if there's restlessness happening. But more often than not, uh, people observe state of restfulness that starts to happen. The person spends more and more time in a state of sleep and uh, non-communication. Uh, so the family members and friends that are with them start to transition from doing, you know, active caregiving to, to just being there, um, being present really. Um, it's what we call a quieter pace of community. And it's an opportunity for, for people to, to uh, spend some really meaningful time Again, words are limited. It doesn't have to be conversational time, uh, just being present. Uh, we do know that uh, people um, are able to hear, even if they are in a coma, uh, in a state of non-responsiveness. 
uh, areas of the brain are activated when they can hear noises. So we, we know that they can hear. So engaging in, in a relationship can continue even when the person is not able to respond. So adjusting to this new pace, stopping the activity that has been probably, maybe it's been going on for a long time, and simply just being a witness to what's happening, just being present, can be really hard for people to do if they're used to, to being active. Um, caregivers have to take regular breaks time because it, this might be a long period of time too. So uh, they need to give themselves uh, permission uh, now I'm going to share the story of, of Robert, um, who was diagnosed with brain cancer and uh, reached out, um, his family and, and him reached out to us for support and, and requested regular home visits, uh, which I was um, happy to provide over the course of a, a few months for him. Um, I would enter the home and I would uh, find the sound of soothing music being played uh, I would um, find him gazing out the window, looking out at the view with a contemplative look on his face. And then we'd start talking about the things that were important to him. And early uh, before his decline happened, it was really important for him to go on one last road trip, to go and visit family and friends. This was uh, uh, something that he made sure that he did. And it, it culminated on a, in a camping trip where uh, all of his family and friends met at a lake and they, they, they had a beautiful weekend together. Um, this was something that um, was, family was, right from the beginning I saw that this was very important for him, connecting with others. Um, slowly our conversations uh, started to become a little bit more difficult, disjointed, jumbled. He'd have good days and bad days uh, because of the brain cancer. He was not, cognitive abilities were were becoming uh, strained. And so uh, it shifted from um, being verbally present to, to, to just being present. And um, sometimes it, it, I got a sense of what he was trying to convey. And, uh, and other times it was difficult to, to understand. But one last visit that I, <clears throat> one of the last visits that I had with him um, before he was completely non-responsive was in the hospital. And he was able to share with me um, an experience that he had. It, it, it was hard to understand if it was a vision or if it was a powerful dream. But he just kept describing this incredible sense of love and connection that he felt. Uh, a sense of something that was kind of bigger and beyond ordinary life. It was definitely a spiritual experience that he had. And I got a sense that he was a spiritual person, although he never really shared um, outwardly uh, uh, what his religious or spiritual beliefs might have been. Uh, it definitely was something that he was actively engaged in in his own personal way that seemed to have, have come out uh, towards the end. Um, <clears throat> so I couldn't help but think that, you know, it was a really um, important work that he had done that, that had helped him to arrive at that, that point. Um, and uh, again, we, 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 we talk about how being um, open and, and uh, to exploring those things that are meaningful to us at end of life is going to be a, a really important part of our journey. So communication becomes more challenging. Uh, challenging if we are depending on having a verbal exchange with the person, or perhaps it's easier if we're comfortable with um, the person being non-responsive. Uh, feelings of disconnection, a feeling of helplessness. Um, if we're not able to um, um, be, if we're not able to communicate with that person anymore, and if that was an important thing for us to do, really hard. But again, they still may be able to hear us. We we uh, want to continue to stay present with them, even if they're non-responsive. So accepting a less than perfect situation. Um, this seems to be uh, the reality uh, of end of life that it's never exactly the way one might want it. I mean, just the fact that someone we love and cherish is now dying, um, that obviously is going to be a, a complication. It's not going to be an outcome that we want. So accepting 
all the aspects of that, uh, finding ways to come to terms with that, uh, an important part of this part of the journey, finding ways of being with someone who is non-responsive. And you can be creative with this. Uh, there's um, many different um, ways that a person can try to be with them. They can read to them, they can bring music in, um, they can they, uh, read poetry to them, they can um, read email communications from loved ones for them. There's so many things that can be done. Expectations about dying as the end approaches. This might have a lot to do with one's misconceptions and fears. Um, we, we, it's normal to fear the unknown. Uh, we, if we've never, we, you will not have experienced the, the death of this particular loved one before, obviously, and the person who is dying has not experienced it before. Uh, so we have to acknowledge that fear is normal. It doesn't mean that it, it, it's a terrible thing. It just means that it's a normal part of the journey. Um, those with prior experience of having lost a loved one, um, they might have some expectations about what that is based on what that prior experience was. It might have been a positive experience or a negative experience for them. So what they might want to do is to say each death is unique to itself. and This is going to be a death that will be unique, unlike any other death that they've had previously, experienced previously. Uh, so how to respond at this time? Focus on what the dying person wants or what you know they wanted. Um, they might have communicated that before they became unresponsive. So continuing that gives uh, the, the, the family members um, uh, a sense of, well, we're doing this for them. There is something that we can do. There is a way that we can still be here for them. And reaching out, again, for the available support. I keep saying this, <laughs> as a hospice society, uh, of course, that's what we are here to do. And, uh, but it's important to remind people of that. Uh, they can seem to get distracted at this time. And then um, I, I hear so often from, from people who come to us for bereavement support that, oh, you know, I, I, I kept meaning to uh, contact you, uh, uh, you know, or we, we kept thinking about, but, or, or we didn't even know that you guys were available, uh, you know, for, for this type of support. So it's important that, um, that that is always something that's kept first and foremost in mind, because no one ever has to do any of this alone. There's always going to be one available and a supportive system out there. Now we come to a new journey begins. What's next? Uh, this might have a lot to do with um, one's spiritual beliefs, um, a sense of greater purpose, greater meaning, something beyond the physical world, perhaps, whatever, however that might be defined. Uh, it might have to do with concrete religious um, beliefs. It might be a prescribed religion that one has or a sense of a, of a, of a god of some type. Uh, it might be personal beliefs. Here we, we, we look at um, uh, uh, what a person did in, in the meaning of their life, to make meaning in their life, what their legacy was, and what, they, what the importance of their life experience was, and how that legacy can echo on. Uh, it could be philosophical beliefs that a person holds about um, afterlife or, or the end of life experience, or what, what, what is life all about after all, right? Uh, these are all very personal things. But we don't want to say that um, we really they have the answers for this. And I think each person holds the answer that works for them within themselves. But we want to acknowledge that a new journey does begin, a new journey of some sort. Uh, but really right now, um, mindful of our time here and the fact that this does bring up a bigger topic that is perhaps best left for another webinar. Also, a new journey of bereavement will begin for those um, who um, are left behind. We'll, we'll use that term, they're left behind. Now they have their lives to live, but their lives have been uh, completely changed uh, because someone that they cherished and loved or had a large, a huge impact in their life is now no longer there physically. So how they define themselves and what they do in their life is now uh, part of um, uh, bereavement, but again, that is for another webinar because that's a pretty big topic as you can imagine. All right, I, I really appreciate you all uh, hanging in there. I, I went through a lot of different um, 
uh, bits of information there. And I'm wondering now if there's any questions or comments that any of you would like to share. Yeah, thank you so much, Trevor. That was a fabulous presentation that had so many jewels. And um, I know it took me on a journey. And um, I wrote copious notes that I will be looking back on later. Um, I am going to read a question here. Um, let me start with the first question. Uh, how can family out of province plus with COVID limits, be part of pro the process constructively? Mm -hmm. Is there oh. Zoom family sessions? Um, so we're talking about the process of a, of a loved one um, experiencing in life, are we a palliative uh, individual, I assume? Um, and how can they be part of that process? Yeah, th th we're, we're seeing that a lot. Uh, let's, let's be really, um, um, honest and mindful about the impact that COVID-19 has had on families uh, with loved ones that are struggling with terminal illness. Uh, we, as humans, we naturally connect with one another. We, we create attachments. And uh, at a time like this, it's really important for those, those connections to be nurtured, to be re-experienced, to be um, celebrated. And it's really hard to do that uh, when we're in, you know, in a state of semi-lockdown and we're wanting to protect uh, our, 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 our family members from potential, uh, you know, uh, exposure to, to um, the illness. So I think this is something that we're all struggling with and we're doing this for the first time. Um, I know uh, Tricia has done some work uh, putting together um, a, 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 a vigil through this, how, how do you call it, Trish? Yeah, remote vigil. Re remote, remote vigil. Vig vigil. Yeah. yeah, and and I can address this a little bit too in that um, I do know that at the hospice residence, um, they do support families to come on board with Zoom and a lot of people have, you know, their telephones with them or an iPad and uh, if they need tech support, um, there's people there to help. Our volunteers, as That's you're aware, um, are not there to, to be a part of that um, support team um, unless really specifically asked. Um, so yeah, families are um, staying connected through online means and um, doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, making the best of a terrible situation, um, Exchanging gifts in the mail, sending like baking cookies and sending, you know, uh, in the mail, uh, sending um, cards, um, doing things like that. Maybe those things have to increase uh, to try to compensate for the lack of physical connection. And then maybe there's, you know, creative ways uh, to meet in a park somewhere, to meet uh, practicing social distancing. Um, there's creative ways that uh, people can, I guess what we're, we really are being challenged to think creatively at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you everyone for participating. Um, like Trevor said, uh, he's kind of ended with a few ideas for later webinars and we are receiving feedback. We're curious about your feedback um, as to how last week's web webinar this week and the future weeks um, how you're finding them to be meaningful or where they're, they're um, perhaps um, not tending to uh, the experience that you know your community is having. And by that, I mean specifically folks who are living in long-term care or have been companioning a loved one for extended period of time um, who's slowly declining. Um, we are looking at putting together um, further webinars with um, content that's really specific to what we are experiencing today. Um, so we hope to hear more from you. And um, unless there's any other comments um, through the chat box or Trevor, do you have more you'd like to share? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just really... Um impressed with um, the interest that, that, that does exist for uh, these topics. Uh, I think the more we talk about these issues, end of life, uh, the more we create um, comfort around these topics. Um, and it's so important because it is, uh, well, we, 
It's universal. We're all going to experience it. But it can be such a meaningful time of life. It can, there's so much potential there uh, for people to have personally for themselves. I've seen it happen. But I've also seen the other side of it where there was a, a lot of uh, unpreparedness. Uh, there was a lot of um, doors uh, that were, you know, blocks uh, going up uh, for, for people. And um, it, it's bad when that happens. And I, I don't think it's necessary. So uh, I think um, being the, the uh, uh, you know, we're all products of our, of our time and age here, our, our culture, our traditions. And uh, we can, can, you know, look at maybe how we can um, uh, learn to be a bit more accepting and open to uh, the end of life experience and be there for one another. Uh, and uh, I, I really um, uh, appreciate everybody having an interest in this because I think we're going to be spreading the word, so to speak, on it as we move forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I fully agree that the more we talk about it, um, the easier it gets. And um, I, I certainly found your presentation so reassuring. So thank you again, Trevor. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We're going to end our, um, our webinar now. And we'll see you next week for Rick Dilworth, who will be presenting Caregiver and Family Support Coordinates. And uh, we look forward to seeing, uh, being part of Rick's webinar next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.